Welcome everybody to the current strategy forum and, uh, and Mr. Brock, uh, the senior advisor to the, to the Secretary of the Navy. Just let me, start, let me start off with a couple of quick remarks before we get into the meat of the conversation, which of course is the major reason we are here the, uh, for this hour. I see maritime statecraft as a process, a habit, and a way of life for a society that aspires to do business in great waters, a society such as our own. Maritime statecraft is a process of wielding levers of state in a concerted way to accomplish national purposes relating to the sea. It's an approach to doing things. This process spans va vastly more than building and deploying a navy or a corps of marines or a coast guard. If we do it right, maritime statecraft will bring together not just the naval services, but fellow services that operate from land. In this age of joint sea power, the US Army and Air Force are sea services just as much as the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard are. We will fail unless we act in unison. But maritime statecraft goes beyond choreographing the actions of armed forces on the high seas. It goes beyond the merchant fleet that transports US-made goods overseas or brings imports back home. It even goes beyond naval and mercantile shipbuilding, a maritime se sector whose health rightly preoccupies us here today. Properly understood, maritime statecraft is an all-consuming process that rallies government, the armed forces, private industry, and regular Americans behind common interests and purposes relating to the sea. Now, Alfred Thayer Mahan, you knew he was gonna come up, our, our most revered alumnus here at the college, never uses the term maritime statecraft. He couldn't have. As the Admiral mentioned, this is a phrase of recent coinage. It dates back just to Secretary Del Toro's address at the Kennedy School last fall. But Mahan would instantly recognize and probably embrace the phrase. After all, it describes the project he had in mind for America. We think of Mahan as a, an apostle of high seas battle. But two naval historians, Margaret and Harold Sprout, from the mid 20th century, note that Mahan's writings operate on multiple levels and are not all about warfare. They observe that Mahan fashioned both a theory of naval strategy and defense, that's the operational part that commands the most attention among navalists, and, and a philosophy of national prosperity and destiny to help shape courses of action for the real world. I consider maritime statecraft part of that Mahanian philosophy for how ambitious maritime powers ought to conduct themselves. Executives of foreign policy and maritime strategy then act on his philosophy, figuring out how to put implements of power to work in specific theaters under specific circumstances. In this way, statecraft gives rise to actionable policy, strategy, and operations. To put his nautical philosophy into action, Mahan urged the United States to cast a sea power chain made up of three lengths. His chain, which is akin to the supply chain familiar to economic geographers today, connected North America to regions of commercial and geopolitical interest. Industrial production and shipbuilding cast the homeward link. Merchant and naval ships plying the sea span the middle link. Foreign harbors and naval stations constitute the distant link. Forge all three, and you complete the connection between industry at home and markets far away. Why mount an effort of, of, of such daunting magnitude? Well, Mahan posited that nations took to the sea for commercial, diplomatic, and military purposes. Commerce was king for him. Commercial access to important rimlands was both the goal and the engine of maritime strategy. Facilitating it was the job of diplomats and naval and military folk. Mahan believed America would prosper through overseas trade and commerce, enriching itself and pouring revenue into U.S. government coffers. The government in Washington would invest some of the proceeds it harvested from commercial interactions to fund a naval guardian for the merchant fleet that traversed the middle link in that sea power chain and to pursue worthwhile geopolitical goals. In short, Mahan perceived a virtuous cycle among commerce, diplomacy, and naval endeavors. Starting up the cycle and keeping it churning into the indefinite future constitutes the prime function of maritime statecraft. But it's more than that. If maritime statecraft is a process, it's also a habit of thought, sentiment, and deed. Human beings are bundles of habits. It should be second nature for leaders in maritime-related fields to think constantly about the sea, to devise actions that further America's maritime cause, and to summon the gumption to see those actions through. Dominant ocean going powers excel at de developing muscle memory within their leadership. Mahan alludes to this when he designates the character of the government as one of six basic determinants of a nation's fitness for sea power. One defeated German admiral from World War I declared that salt water coursed through British veins during Great Britain's era of maritime supremacy. 
the sea was that pervasive in, in, in Great Britain. We should strive to make ourselves worthy of such a compliment today. So another function of maritime statecraft involves implanting a strategic ethos among top political, naval, and military leadership. Ingrained re reflexes orient leadership towards the oceans, seas, and inland waterways, and toward policies, regulations, and laws that keep the links in the sea power chain stout. Statecraft helps them oversee the virtuous cycle among commerce, diplomacy, and armed force. And lastly, maritime statecraft should nurture a national way of life centered on seaward enterprises. Mahan makes the character of the people another critical determinant of sea power. A venturesome people goes to sea in search of prosperity and geopolitical gain. It flourishes where a people that turns inward tends to falter. But how do you bend the character of a people towards maritime pursuits? Well, we, you can do what we did this year, look to the ancients for inspiration. The Athenian philosopher Aristotle ruminated about the regime, seeking out the best form of rule. By regime, Aristotle meant not just civics class stuff, but the way of life that prevailed in a city, state, or other polity. He meant that the pre prevalent customs or mores, or as we would say nowadays, the prevalent culture. Culture is who we tell ourselves who we tell ourselves we are, what we do, and what we aspire to. It's how things are done here. For Aristotle, the job of political leadership, <coughs> pardon me, was to enact measures that vectored the culture, nourishing desirable traits among the populace. In Athens, the character of the people came to center on seafaring, broadly construed to include domestic industry, which manufactured wares to satisfy the wants and needs of foreign buyers, fleets of merchantmen to transport exports across the deep and carry imports back home a fleet of fighting ships to protect merchant vessels on their voyages hither, hither and yon, and a foreign policy that burnished the standing enjoyed by the city. In short, Athens was a Mahanian society millennia before Mahan. A seafaring way of life is congenial to maritime statecraft and is enhanced by it. A thriving nautical society is drenched in seawater. Marine affairs permeates everything the government, military, and people think, feel, and do. That being the case, maritime statecraft is also cultural renovation and upkeep. Policy and strategy lie downstream of culture. If this venture succeeds, maritime statecraft will reignite and turbocharge American society's awareness of and love affair with the sea. And if that happens, wise policies, laws, and regulations will fall in the course of things, helping us keep the cycle among commerce, diplomacy, and ships turning for all time. Now, Steve, let me step off my uh, soapbox and, and, and get this conversation going in earnest. Have I described the concept of maritime statecraft accurately? I mean, what, what have I missed or what have I mangled in, in, the, in the telling? <laughs> so Dr. Holmes, uh, that was a very rich and uh, thoughtful and extraordinary description of maritime statecraft. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I assume you have more questions than, than that, so uh, I've uh, made a few notes of a couple uh, points that I'm going to address, but I'll weave in uh, thoughts throughout the rest of, the rest of my answers because you've really covered, um, covered it in a really, a really profound way. Before I do that, though, uh, I want to uh, congratulate all of you. Uh, I also want to, uh, to thank you for having me here today. It's a great honor. I want to uh, pass uh, the greetings of Secretary Del Toro. Uh, you know how much he loves this institution, how much it means to him. Uh, he was thrilled that maritime statecraft is the topic. Um, he's been thrilled by the War College's collaboration with Brookings and with the Naval Postgraduate School on maritime statecraft in, in recent um, events over the last several months. Um, and Admiral Garvin, thank you so much um, for your leadership and, and for, for what's happening here. One of the goals that I have um, for my time on stage um, is to let you all know that uh, the nation doesn't know it yet, uh, but the nation really needs this institution. Uh, it needs all of you because maritime statecraft is not just a process. It's not just a culture or a mindset. It is a call to action to revive the maritime power of the nation at a moment when we very much need it. Um, to your comments. One of the things that I noted was the chain, the three links uh, in the chain that Mahan had so eloquently described. That chain doesn't exist anymore. Um, over the course of the last 30 to 40 years, uh, two important links um, have dissipated. And uh, over the long term, you know, history has shown that there's never been a great naval power 
that wasn't also a commercial shipbuilding and shipping power. We are only a naval power at this point. We're the world's greatest navy, uh, but in order to sustain that, we need to bring back the other elements of the chain. That has driven a lot of, of what maritime statecraft has become as we have sort of formulated it in the first couple years of the Secretary's term. You know, when the Secretary was nominated for the job um, and we started thinking about, you know, the challenges that lay ahead, obviously shipbuilding and ship maintenance um, and getting the Navy where it needs to be uh, to pace our challenge um, was paramount. So the second thing I'd like to say is we've had the luxury of surviving without those two other chains um, for these last several decades uh, because we thought we didn't have a competitor. And now we all fully realize that we have a competitor. We have the first full spectrum maritime power since probably 125 years ago, since the United Kingdom. And uh, to call them a competitor or to call us a competitor is very generous in numerous aspects of maritime power, right? Um, I'll, just give you some, I'll just give you some statistics. Uh, the Chinese are building about 1,600 ships a year. We're building less than five in the commercial space, ocean-going international trade. Chinese have 1.6 million people um, involved in the maritime sphere. We have about 11,000. Half of those work for the Military Sea Lift Command. They have 13 shipyards, one of which is greater than all of ours combined. We are less than 1% of global commercial shipbuilding, yet we are the world's biggest economy. And it was only in the 1970s that we were the world's biggest shipbuilder and had one of the world's largest um, flag fleets. Chinese have, combined with the, the Hong Kong flag, about nine to 10,000 flag vessels. We have 77 in international trade. Um, and so how have we survived um, with what seems to be very little maritime power um, and only naval power for the last several decades? Um, we have outsourced all of it essentially abroad, right? So when we got out of the shipbuilding business um, in the 1980s, um, two of our closest allies, the Koreans and the Japanese, picked up the slack. Uh, but then, and I was talking to Secretary Del Toro about this as we were formulating the, the Columbia speech, was a, a precursor of the Harvard speech. You know, when he commissioned the Balkali in New York City, the first event in New York City after 9-11, it was at the same time frame that we assisted China into the WTO. And over the course of those decades, since he commissioned the Balkali in China, expanded its global trade, um, not only have they dramatically expanded the size and, and capabilities of their Navy, but what's been even more impressive is how they've expanded their dominance in the maritime sector. In commercial shipbuilding, um, in ship-to-shore cranes, in containers, in control of ports, strategic ports around the world, canals, the financial levers of the, of the entire industry. Um, and we've been going in the, in the, in the opposite direction. And so the Secretary has determined that um, that, that is worth rallying the nation behind and, and, and changing our, our, the arc of our trajectory on. Uh, not only because it accrues tremendous benefit to the Navy to be able to build you know, affordable ships and in the, in the numbers we need and on time, um, but it also, is, it also helps in, in the near-term things that he's trying to do to increase the lethality and presence of the current fleet that we have. You know, several of these initiatives, Rearm at Sea, and several of the other uh, logistics initiatives to make us more lethal and present with the, with the force that we have depend on the Military Sea Lift Command. And the Military Sea Lift Command depends on civilian merchant mariners. And there's a crisis right now um, in civilian merchant mariners, both in the mer Maritime Security Program, the Tanker Security Program, and, and also in, uh, in the Military Sea Lift Command. Um, and then, of course, we rely he heavily and the you know, unclassified versions of the, of the war plans that you guys all study you know, show a need for m a much greater logistics force than we currently have. We have uh, five tankers in the tanker security program when you know, upwards of 80 are needed or more. Uh, we have a maritime security program that can't support the ready reserve fleet and, and the maritime security program at the same time. You know, as we ended the support to the commercial uh, shipping industry in the 1980s, all of those ships that we inherited ended up in the ready reserve fleet, many of them. They're averaging 47 years old right now. Very hard to get them underway. Um, we decided since we weren't gonna be able to have 
you know, our own merchant fleet, which is once the biggest in the world, uh, before many of you were born, but when I was alive, um, we came up with these workarounds. So we have the maritime security program where we pay ships to reflag and take on a US crew. Um, and none of those ships are built in America. The big ships, the roll and roll off ships, I think six to eight of them are actually built in China. Um, same thing with the tanker security program. So uh, th there is a very important sea lift aspect to this. There is a very important manning of the maritime uh, sea lift command part of this. And there's also like an imperative to revive the maritime power of the nation, to generate the economic drivers for the workforce we need, to build the ships we need and the numbers we need affordably uh, to meet the challenge that we're facing right now. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we are in violent agreement on a lot of things, obviously. I mean, what is the, I mean, could we get a little bit more specific? What, I mean, what does maritime statecraft look like in practice? How does it work? I mean, uh, what, is, what, is the, what is the organization? I mean, if you, if you could just put a little more meat on the boat. Uh, so, um, well, first of all, it looks like this, right? It's, it's all of you. Um, it's this dialogue that we're having. Uh, you know, the secretary uh, is, you know, we have the AAA. Awareness, advocacy, and action. You know, a lot of what I've just described, of course, is outside of the authorities of the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, but it, his advocacy, his driving action through his political position as the leader of the department, his access to the other leaders across the administration and at the local and, and, and state level um, is absolutely critical to, to changing the direction that we're going. It's not sufficient, um, but without his advocacy, um, it's not gonna happen. So, you know, I, I can give you uh, a whole range of, uh, of examples of how we are trying to, um, this, this small fire that we've started, right? Um, we're trying to nurture it. And you guys, as he said, you know, you have answered the call that he, he, that he gave out in Harvard um, for intellectual, you know, fuel to that fire for um, the, your efforts, the oxygen to, to grow that fire and to keep it, keep it burning strong because we have to get the rest of the stakeholders on board. Um, so uh, you know, I'll, I'll run through several you know, uh, specific examples of, of how he's, he's going about this. The first stop that we made was Secretary Buttigieg and Admiral Phillips, the, uh, the mayor administrator and the Secretary of Transportation. Um, and we told them how important DOT is and how important Merritt is um, to what we're trying to accomplish slid across the table to Secretary Buttigieg, it's Title 46. Uh, both the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of Transportation still have in law authorities to grant construction differentials for the construction of commercial ships as long as they can deem a national security purpose to the vessel. That's still in law. There's multiple other things that are still in law that just haven't been funded since the 1980s. And because they haven't been funded, sort of the, the muscle memory that you mentioned and also the, the infrastructure at various agencies around Washington has, has sort of like dissipated. So that was one of the first places we went um, and, you know, and received a positive reception there. Uh, the secretary has gone to the OMB director and has advocated very strongly for the kind of national security funding that MARAD needs and the US Coast Guard needs to fill out this vision of a, of a comprehensive maritime power because he sees all the maritime players in the federal government as, 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 as critical stakeholders in this. We went to Ambassador Tai, the US Trade Representative. Uh, she was the most like-minded. She, uh, she got it right away. Um, she was struck by the fact that you know, 90% of our country's imports and exports, our trade with the entire world goes by sea, right? And of that 90%, 99.6% is not carried on US flagships. And so we thought through, you know, what does that mean to the US economy in times of crisis, let alone conflict? What kind of levers can our adversaries pull, even just subtly, you know, uh, fueling issues, maintenance issues, scheduling issues, just to delay the flow of trade on the high seas by a matter of days or weeks. Remember what happened in COVID, the supply chains? Just imagine if a nefarious actor was using the immense power they've amassed in the maritime sphere to do that to us, something that we've entirely ceded. Uh, you know, we've gone to 
um, Secretary Raimondo and talked about Commerce's ability to do strategic industry studies and to also meet some of their goals on direct foreign investment into that sector. Um, you know, the, the, the Secretary has uh, you know, talked with Jake Sullivan about his strategic industries that are critical for national security, economic security, that require public investment to spur um, private capital. And we've made the case, you know, I think very thoroughly that shipbuilding is one of those strategic industries. Uh, in fact, there are now uh, multiple White House processes that are going uh, in this area, including, um, you know, uh, we worked very hard to get the National Economic Council to take on shipbuilding and the defense industrial base um, as an issue, and that started uh, late last summer, and that proceeds as the first time the National Economic, Economic Council you know, has done that. Uh, you know, the Department of Energy. Just yesterday, we had lunch with uh, Jigger Shaw, who runs the loan program office at Department of Energy. And the Department of Energy, just in the last, you know, after talking to DOE over the last two years, in the last several weeks, they have done a tentative rulemaking that makes the infrastructure money and the IRA money that they have available um, for advanced technology uh, vehicle manufacturing program that you know you all know as what they've done to provide nine billion dollars to Ford and eight billion dollars General Motors to build EV plants for you know vehicles and light trucks. They have made the decision that that now applies to the maritime industry. So that now that money, those loans, are available to not only refurbishing shipyards, dormant shipyards, which we've been pushing hard for, uh, but even greenfield sites, new shipyards. And then the Title 17 clean energy financing money has now been expanded from vehicles to ships, right? So these are commercial vessels that only have to be, according to their current standards, 10% better on the emissions baseline than current marine diesel. Uh, those ships are already being built in various parts of the world. Uh, and so there is the potential for $120 billion of IRA and infrastructure money that is now available for a first mover in commercial shipyard modernization and, uh, and the production of commercial ships. And all of that can have naval vessels built at the same shipyards. There's no prohibition against uh, the, sh the naval ships being built at the same shipyards that would, be, that would be funded through that mechanism. The Secretary has done a lot of outreach on maritime statecraft on the Hill. And there's, you've probably seen some of the draft legislation that's, you know, we've got various champions, Rep. Waltz, Senator Kelly is doing amazing things. Uh, you know, they, the, a year after going to MARAD and meeting with Senator Buttigieg, he was asked, to, the Secretary was asked to be the keynote speaker at National Maritime Day. Senator Kelly was there also, and we kind of showcased what has happened over the last year. You know, there's a version of the Ships Act in the work. There's the, uh, the Mariner Act, which is uh, the marine ad advantage resulting in economic resilience and security. Uh, that's, you know, kind of working through the process right now. And all of this is not only focused on naval shipbuilding, but it's also focused on the larger uh, commercial broader, broader ecosystem. The other thing I'd point out, stakeholders such as uh, civil society, um, you know, all the work being done by all of you, but also unions. So we have gone um, and met with union presidents. Uh, there's very innovative things going on right now with, you know, I went to Cleveland and the Boilermakers are taking their construction part of the union um, and putting them through uh, shipboard welding training to be a rotational uh, workforce for us to, to get at that, at that problem. And several other union presidents have reached out uh, wanting to integrate their apprentice training program uh, you know, to, to Navy standards and to, to help out on this cause. Um, so I think that uh, um, I would end on perhaps um, the State Department. Um, I don't want to leave them out. Uh, Secretary has had several discussions with uh, the Deputy Secretary, Kirk Campbell, uh, because we not only um, are reaching out across the nation, but the Secretary has gone to our allies and partners, uh, both in Europe and in Northeast Asia, uh, and has basically made it clear to them and also to our, our State Department leaders you know, that we are very fortunate in having as allies um, some of the world's greatest shipbuilders. Um, and that is a asset that we should not take, you know, that we should not underestimate. Um, and we provide, we can work with them on strategic depth so that ability, that capability can be used um, in times of crisis and conflict, but also that tremendous capability can be used um, here in the United States, U.S. owned subsidiary is Jones Act compliant uh, to bring competition and to also uh, open up some Jones Act markets that don't exist to date because we just don't have the capability to build those complex ships in America.
Thanks a lot. There, there's clearly a ton of stuff going on, which, is, which I think is all to the good. I, I think that would be one, uh, it would be interesting to try to conjure up my hand and ask him about that last bit that you were talking about with allied, allied contributions, especially in the commercial ship building area, because that was certainly something that just was not even on his radar screen. So, but, uh, so yeah, definitely some differences between uh, then and now. The, uh, just, our students are intimately familiar after, after this year in Newport with the, the concept of the Clausewitzian Triangle. Quite clearly, we're not going to make this project go without, without the, the support of the American people and, and our allies overseas. So if I, if I go out to Buskers, our Irish bar down to, in downtown Newport after this, after this forum today, which I might, <laughs> and if, if, I sit down, if I sit down with my Guinness, how do I, how do I explain it to the, to the guy sitting next to me who's also sipping his Guinness in a way that he will immediately understand? How do I get his support? How do I, how do I fire his enthusiasm for a, for a concept like maritime statecraft? Well, I'm not sure I'll bring up my hand uh, would, uh, would, uh, would do it. Um, but, you know, and what I'd say um, is the most important thing for the average person out there, um, you know, and, and so, you know, it's what I've just described to you is the secretary going around and building awareness and advocating for actually the equities of all the people that I just mentioned, right? And there's more, uh, there's more. Uh, Building awareness that we're a maritime nation. Um, what I've just told you has not been obvious to some people that have a lot of power and influence throughout our, our, our government. Um, and so we also need to reach out uh, to the American people. Uh, and so one of the most important things that we all know is the economy and you know, the personal economy. Everybody, how they interact with the economy themselves. Um, and I, I think what I described a little bit earlier on you know, the threat that our supply chains are, are, you know, are under that folks don't realize, the threat to, um, you know, folks getting what they need to get and being able to work where they need to work, um, and how fragile it is based on our dependence on foreign flag to carry most of our, our, our trade abroad. Um, you know, I would also, uh, you know, most everybody out there is aware of China. Uh, they just might not be aware of um, China's formidable levers of power across the entire maritime sector. Um, so combining the real economic interests that they have with their notion, this general notion of China as a competitor and a threat um, into you know, some of I've just described would be a powerful, I think, way to do it. Also, um, you know, I've mentioned a lot about our lost power that we need to regain, but I always like to emphasize that this isn't about going back to the 1970s. Um, the fashion and music alone would probably not want us to do that. But, um, but this is about the future, right? So we're talking, about, um, we're talking about your grandchildren and your children's opportunities, your grandchildren and children's shipyard, you know, the economy and the prosperity that they live in. We're talking about a digital shipyard. We're talking about cutting edge technologies. We're not talking about um, the kind of shipyards that you know, we currently have. Um, and there, is, there has been some, some progress in recent years, but you know, we build the world's most um, capable and sophisticated warships at mid 20th century shipyards, right? And if you think about that, that means that they often, most often don't arrive on time and they cost a lot more than they should um, because we're doing things in a very inefficient way. Um, there are models abroad that um, are very 21st century because they're driven by competition because as China has taken over 50% of the global shipbuilding market, um, the former dominant players, Korea and Japan, have had to fight tooth and nail to try to keep their part of, part of the market. Um, the other thing I'd say on, you know, uh, Mahan, um, Mahan, uh, how you guys like to say it here, um, you know, is... You know, he, you know, he talked about, um, you know, in his influence of Super Armpon history, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but, you know, the distant, the distant weather-beaten ships, you know, that stood between the Grand Army and Global Dominion, um, referring to the Royal Navy. And, you know, you know one way to, to think about this for the, you know, the American people is, uh, you know, we're a maritime nation, but very few remember that. And so um, there is this distant, these distant Chinese flagships, these distant behemoths of Chinese shipyards, these you know, unseen financial transactions um, in the maritime sphere. 
uh, that the American people don't see that you know, threaten to you know, keep, to, to, to pull us further away from the international world, world, world order um, and you know, the way that um, you know, freedom of the seas and democracies have functioned, um, the way Mahan envisioned, you know, uh, we don't see it, right? There's sea blindness. And so, you know, I would, I, would make the, I would make that, but not probably bring up his name, because they might not resonate with that. Uh, but I would also say that, um, you know, China has apparently thoroughly read Mahan. Um, and they are taking actions to carry out that virtuous cycle of economic power, commercial maritime power, you know, leading to naval power, leading to more maritime power. And, um, and you, of course, in your Red Star over the Pacific with Yoshi Teshihara, who will be here later today, you know, also, also made that point. Um, and so it's, you know, this is, this is grand strategy. Um, and, you know, another point um, that uh, Hunter Styers, who I'd like to thank, um, and who's been a fellow here at the Naval War College for a while and is, is a member of our team, you know, he likes to point out that, you know, Nimitz was able to risk, you know, his last carriers at Midway because he knew he had many more being built in shipyards and many, many more after that, wave after wave on the drawing boards, right? Because the industrial might of the United States. And the Japanese knew they didn't have that. And they knew that they had to act. And they acted a little bit abruptly and oftentimes because they didn't have the luxury of the industrial might that we had. And some, you know, some would argue that the roles are reversed. China is now us, we are now Japan. Who do you think can reconstitute faster? Who has the shipyards and the industrial might to reconstitute faster, us or them right now? And so um, that, I think, would be like my final point um, to raise to your friend in the bar, um, because I think that kind of drives the point home, right? We cannot continue to function as a dominant global Navy that we are today without bringing back all of the foundational requisites um, to keep that going for your grandchildren and their grandchildren. Terrific topic, um, and thank you so much uh, for taking the time that sets the stage for the rest of the conference and uh, really the, the discussion about maritime statecraft as we begin and, um, and a conversation that needs to be had and a conversation that we hope uh, continues uh, nationally. So thank you very much. Please. Welcome, Han, for that. <clears throat>